Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order at 607 of the Southwick Tallinn Granville Regional School Committee. This is our December 1st meeting. Um, there will be two opportunities this evening for public comment. If you wish to submit a public comment this evening, please send an email to superintendent at stgrsd.org. Okay, tonight's agenda, we are gonna move things around a little bit. Uh, we're going to jump to action items after the student advisory report. Um, so we will be kind of moving around a little bit tonight. All right, first up in your package, you should have received a secretary's report um, for the right date, Amy? No, it should be 11-24 yeah. was last Tuesday's meeting. Sorry about that. It's okay. So I'll entertain a motion to accept the secretary's report dated 11-24-2020. So moved. I second. Any comments or questions? Okay, we will do a roll call vote to accept these meeting minutes. Pam? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ted? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Okay, moving on, uh, warrants. Uh, so Amy was kind enough to email us warrant articles earlier today. If you haven't done so already, please take some time. We do the warrant articles, sign them, and return them. Uh, any correspondence this evening? Yes, thank you, Chairman Hull. Uh, we did receive our yearly letter uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and local educational agencies across the Commonwealth have made it their priority to increase educational access and equity for our most marginalized students, especially students with disabilities. This priority necessitates that we identify significant disproportionality in special education and respond to it. In alignment with this work annually, the department is required to analyze data from LEAs to identify and report to the Federal Office of Special Education Programs significant disproportionality in special education of racial and ethnic groups. This analysis is conducted pursuant to requirements under the Indiv Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA. The department has reviewed your LEA student information management system and student safety and discipline report data from three prior school years and has not identified significant disproportionality by race or ethnicity in special education identification, placement, or discipline in your LEA. And that is all I have tonight for correspondence. Thank you for sharing. Okay, at this point, it's time for our first public comment, and I will ask Amy to check the superintendent account. Chairman Hool, I have no emails in the superintendent account. Moving on to student advisory. The students like to make a report out this time. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, for the student uh, advisory report, as of right now, students are just con uh, concerned about when they uh, about their winter uh, sports, and uh, but they understand that there is no update as of right now because of COVID nineteen, and students are also curious about when we would be able to go back to school for it. But they um, completely understand if it's not safe, then we cannot go back immediately. And that is about it for the student advisory report. Thank you for sharing. 
Okay, so we're going to jump down to action items. And we'll circle back to educational presentations. Move to accept the revisions to the Appendix B section of the agreement between the Southwick Tallinn Granville Regional School District and the Southwick Tallinn Granville Regional Education Association Unit A contract dated August 25th, 2019 to August 24th, 2022 with the revisions to positions and pay effective August 25th, 2020 recommended. So moved. Did you hear me? No, so I filled in. I didn't know. Oh, all right, so I'll second it. <laughs> Any questions on the Appendix B? Okay, hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote to approve this. Uh, Pam? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ed? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes seven zero zero. Move to approve home education proposal HS two thousand twenty one eighty three recommended. So moved. Second. Any questions on this home ed proposal? Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Pam's up first. Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ed? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Brian? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes 7-0-0. Move to approve one school choice seat for 12th grade for the 2020-2021 school year for an existing student recommended. So moved. Second. Any questions on this action item? Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Pam? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ted? Yes. Don? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes seven zero zero. Move to approve the 2020-2021 school year fundraisers, Southwick Regional School Class of 2024 apparel sale with school logo and Class of 2024 candy grail sale recommended. So move. Second. Any questions on this action item? Okay, seeing none, we'll start with Pam. Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ed? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes 7 0 0. Move to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Southwick Tallinn Granville Regional School Committee and Robin Gunn, Director of Student Services, which amends the terms of the July 1, 2020 employment contract, including work year and attachment A recommended. So moved. Second. Any questions on this uh, amendment? Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Pam? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ted? Yes. John? Yes. Maria? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes 7-0-0. Okay, so now we're going to go back to educational presentations. Uh, up first is Principal Sasso for Woodland Out Elementary School. Hello, good evening. Amy, are you going to scroll it further? Perfect. 
All right, so in the yellow is what is changed from last year to this year, and you'll see things that are crossed off that are not existing this year that were in last year's. So under engaged learning, we're gonna to continue to develop math essential advancing questions to use during our instruction when conferring, continue to provide professional development in our math workshop model. Uh, the Summer Math Institute was one of our um, professional development opportunities and we will have another opportunity in December. Um, provide students with more choices so that barriers uh, to demonstrate understanding are reduced and eliminated. What we've added this year in our work with Alex Hirschberg and our counselors and our behaviorists is that our counselors are um, developing concrete takeaways to embed social emotional support. So these takeaways are being provided to the classroom teachers to be used during the month. And our behavior interventionist um, has identified universal proactive tier one intervention strategies and is coaching teachers on the implementation and fidelity. And this is really occurring more when we were in person. Um, it's harder to do that remote at this point, but um, when we come back in person, we'll be continuing that model. Under shared educational leadership, uh, our walkthroughs are gonna be a little bit different. <laughs> right now we're doing remote, um, popping in on our classes, but we'll continue to um, coordinate that in our professional development and what we can do with our PLC work um, will be ongoing. Continue to support our grade level team leaders and the refinement of our math curriculum. Uh, new teachers uh, will participate in various leadership committees, although we've had these participations in the other years, it's just stated in this document. And we have things like um, committees such as child study, staff, team leaders, and so forth. Um, we're gonna reflect and refine on school-wide behavioral expectations. The change here being both when we're, whether in person or remote. Uh, we're gonna adapt, and we have already, um, adapt our CARES initiative to support social distancing while we're in person and in the remote learning setting. And then instead of our trauma-informed task force doing the work um, with our tier one level and monitoring for fidelity that will be under the role of the administration, counselors and behaviorists that that will be taking place. With um, instructional technology, our focus has been to deploy district devices to students um, pre-K to two so that they can participate in remote learning, providing families with access to technology support to also support the needs during our remote learning um, and providing professional development and trainings for families and for staff around the area um, topics of Zoom and Teams and Microsoft Office. And we then just took out the piloting iPads that was accomplished last year. <clears throat> the library media specialists worked with classroom teachers on that implementation. And we were increasing the use of technology in the second grade classroom. That was all work of last year. So that's removed from this year. And under the guaranteed and viable curriculum, Teachers will continue to participate in coaching cycles. Those have been on hold right now while we are still acclimating to all the changes and um, preparing for uh, engaging students in both in-person and remote learning. But teachers will participate in ongoing professional development in math to build their content capacity, support student engagement, and assess student learning in a variety of ways while remote. We have common math benchmark assessments and then we have assessment data that will be reviewed so that we can look um, and identify learning gaps that need to be addressed due to COVID-19. I don't know if you have questions. Any questions for Principal Sasso? Um, I just have a comment that a lot of districts are scared to take on tier one intervention in the social emotional world and it's really um, impressive. They're scared because they don't know what they're going to get kind of when you start screening for social emotional um, issues and things like that. And it's just, I'm really proud that that's part of our narrative right now. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Principal Sasso. We'll move on to the next presentation. So next we have Principal Fahey Carrier for Powder Mill School. Good evening, everyone. So uh, 
my presentation is going to look very similar to Kim's in that I also use the uh, cross out feature. So anything that was there last year that's no longer going to be, you'll be able to see the cross out. And in highlight, I have anything we've added. So it should be an easy document to see the switches between last year and this year. Um, I would say that the crossed out um, areas are all being removed because those are things we've worked on and feel like we're being successful on and have made real progress in implementation. Um, at first, when I started to think about creating this document again, working through it, I worried that I was going to have to cross some things out that we were working on that we hadn't got finished with yet um, because we were going to be adding so much with COVID. Um, but I was really pleasantly surprised to go through it and, and really be able to say, you know, we've already taken that on. And in the two years um, that I've been in, at, at, at Powder Mill, we've made some progress on them. So I don't feel like we're crossing off anything that uh, we're losing. It's all things that we've successfully implemented. Next, you're going to see some that have both, some cross out and some highlight. Those are our ongoing objectives. And um, we have taken some of our crucial objectives and started to amend them to how do we implement them in this new world that we're living on of, of remote versus hybrid, uh, pivoting between the two. Um, a really good example of that is um, under engaged learning, the last um, the last line is developing staff student relationships and student student relationships in a socially distant and remote classroom. We took out the vertical system. I know some of you probably remember our colleges last year that we were working on uh, with cohorts. We can no longer work on the vertical system, but we've added in this socially distant remote. So we're still really looking at our primary work of supporting student engagement in tier one trauma work by building relationships. We just have to look at a different way now. Um, so you're gonna see a number of the, the bullets here. They're not actually bulleted, I apologize. A number of the objectives here are adding in, how do you, how do, you do this remote? How do you do this socially distant um, without really changing our overall focus? And the last you're gonna see are some brand new highlighted ones that are, are completely different than what we expected. And those are completely COVID related at this point, I will say. Um, any additional things that we're taking on, we're doing because we, we need to make sure that we have remote and socially distant practices that are going to um, really work for our students. So for example, the third to last um, line under guaranteed and viable curriculum is to develop a schedule that provides maximum in-person learning for third and fourth grade and our vulnerable learners. Um, you know, that was a huge project that we have been working on and continue to work towards making sure all of our vulnerable learners have as much in-person time as possible. Um, also, just beyond that, the next one, developing protocols to move learners between models based on individual classroom grade level and school-wide needs. You know, we are very proud of the fact that um, of the students who we've had to have quarantine for one reason or the other, three quarters of them have been able to shift immediately from in-person to remote um, within a day or two. So if a student is not feeling well and they're homesick for a day and we need to have them get a COVID test and we know that they're gonna be out for a number of days, when the parent says to us, okay, you know, he or she's feeling better, we're able to pivot them right into that remote learning so there's minimal school loss. That has taken a lot of protocol building, um, but it's an ongoing goal that we're gonna continue to have to work on. Um, so that is kind of our document. I know you all have a chance to read it um, because you already have gotten it. So I don't know if you have any specific questions about any of them. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Last educational presentation is from A.D. Santerman for Winter Athletics at SRS. Yeah, hello. Uh, first, I wanna begin by thanking the school committee, Superintendent Willard for allowing me to speak here tonight. Um, I know this decision is not going to be an easy one and it's not going to be popular, popularly received either way. There is no right or wrong answer here and I am very you know, sensitive to that um, as, as we begin here. Um, I do want to 
I guess, not apologize, but at least make you aware that the, the, it is a fairly lengthy presentation. I want it to be comprehensive and to um, you know, include as much data and much information as, as much uh, specifics as, as I could within the presentation for your deliberation uh, on this decision. So I, you know, it, it, I'll try to zip through it. And uh, if there's any questions, obviously we can circle back to anything as, as we go. Uh, Amy, I do not have control of this screen though. I don't. Hi Dave. <clears throat> um, I was trying to give you control over the mouse, but there's a limited number of names in the menu. Okay. Are you able to request control? Um, I'm not sure how. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I think you need to enable sharing, maybe. I'm not sure. I mean, if you Under want to view options on the green, little green bar at the top of the screen, there's an option that says view options in black. And I think there's a drop down. Yeah. Or you can request remote control. Uh, the only thing it's showing me is original size and enter full screen. Oh. All right, well, I can okay. just. You just tell me when and okay. I'll well, click you. You can start <laughs> okay. now. Go ahead. All right, so the purpose of the presentation, uh, a few things that I want, I want to get across in this presentation, we want to outline some existing guidance, describe how uh, SRS athletic department is going to meet or exceed that guidance, we're going to present and discuss relevant concerns regarding the spread of COVID-19 through athletic participation, present information relative to the current uh, COVID-19 spread in the community and our current, current status. And at the end, we're going to offer some options for how we may safely participate in an athletics uh, winter season. Next. Um, some of the topics we're going to get into, we'll start with fall athletics, go into where we are, current, current COVID numbers, and the status of the winter season um, with, with uh, preparations. I'm going to probably just gloss over the EEA and MIAA guidance um, that has, has been out for a little while now, and it's fairly similar to what was in the fall. We'll, we'll talk more at length about the sports specific guidance and some of the SRS athletic plans in general. That's where we're gonna focus most of the discussion or the, the presentation today will be on, on the plan. And at the end, we have some stakeholders feedback surveys that I did and finish up with the proposals of which, uh, what our options might be. So for fall athletics, we know at SRS, uh, we had no COVID issues here relating to intramurals or to golf. Uh, we had 60 athletes, give or take, participating in the fall. Uh, throughout the PVIAC, uh, I sent out a survey to all PVIAC athletic directors. Um, 38 of them responded. Two of the 38 reported uh, COVID cases that were likely spread directly through athletic participation. Um, one of those involved a hockey tournament prior to the PBIAC season beginning, um, but it, uh, the, the quarantine of the players involved um, led into the start of the season. So that, that, one, that one was uh, something that they reported. The other one, uh, one team member tested positive. They shut down the team, uh, quarantined everybody, tested everybody, and that no, nobody else on the team uh, tested positive. Uh, out of the 38 ADs surveyed, 19 of them, half of them had their athletic teams impacted, which was canceled practices or games due to exposure or contact tracing. Um, five of the ADs reported having in-person student learning impacted due to contact tracing. So obviously that's, that's an area that um, is, is of concern, having a, um, in student learning impacted is, is probably the, the most significant impact that, that we felt in the fall within the PBIC. Uh, at the MIAA level, I, there, there is no data, so to speak. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence. Uh, I've talked to a few people, some of them are listed here, uh, that say that there's really nothing linking uh, athletic participation to the spread of the virus in, in terms of on the field, on the court, et cetera. Um, the evidence shows that behaviors outside of the, the athletic participation itself has is, is had a greater impact, you know, tailgating, uh, congregating before and after, uh, not wearing masks, social distancing, that kind of thing. That, that's been the bigger impact 
to uh, athletic cases. So. Current status, the uh, Mass EEA issued its guidance on November 7th, uh, and MIA on November 21st. Um, you can see here some of the things that MIA um, came out with. Uh, the biggest one is that uh, basketball, ice hockey, and skiing were approved to compete in the winter with the modifications that we're going to uh, get into later on. MIA postponed the start date for winter to December 14th, but the PVIAC went a step further and postponed any PVIAC competition or, or practice until January 4th to get through the Christmas holiday. So we're looking at uh, 10 days after Christmas for the first practices. And then it would be another 10 days beyond that before any games would be played within the PVIAC. And the PVIAC will schedule the season with, with bubbles. Uh, we don't know which teams or schools will be in our bubbles yet. That's still to be determined. Um, this one here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. I think you guys live these numbers probably daily. Um, just the number of cases that we have in the area. And we know that based on the current MOA, our district remains fully remote. So from an athletic standpoint, if and when uh, the district goes, is fully remote, athletics would shut down as well. Uh, we're not going to try to run an athletic program when the schools aren't, aren't running. So uh, EEA guidance. Again, I'm not going to get into any specifics here. We're going to kind of move through this just to, in the interest of time. But if we want to circle back later on, we can. Uh, next, you can probably skip the next two, Amy. Just go quickly through those. MIA guidance again. All right, for, for this one, um, sports specific for basketball. Again, this is the MIAA guidance. Um, I've got three slides on this. Um, basically, to put it in a nutshell, they've they've modified the, the game up a little bit to to um, cut cut out some of the downtime and to increase social distancing opportunities. Halftime has been eliminated. Uh, the length of time between each quarter is now two and a half minutes, um, and that's the, also the length of time for halftime. Um, game ball is going to be changed out at the end of each quarter. I believe at SRS, if we if if and when we were to to uh, have games, we could do it even better than that and, and rotate game balls out and, and sanitize the game balls frequently throughout each quarter and, and rotate them out several times per game. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the jump ball has been eliminated. So rather than have everybody congregating at center court for the jump ball at the beginning of the game, there'll be a coin flip to determine the initial possession and then using the possession arrow. Uh, the free throw lane, uh, players will not be allowed to line up in the free throw lane for the rebound until the live shot. So if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, they'll line up for that first shot. If it's a two shots, the first one, they'll be spread out throughout the court, socially distanced. And then when the second shot is taken, uh, the players will line up and it'll become a live ball. Next. Uh, in order to avoid unnecessary contact, if a team is looking to foul the opposition at the end of the game to, to stop the clock. Uh, the coach or a player from the team just needs to tell a referee, you know, we want to, we're going to foul them on the inbound. And then at any point, at any, any contact at all, uh, the referee will just blow the whistle and, and stop the game for the foul. So we don't need any significant contact there. Just a conversation with the official. Um, any loose balls uh, that are tied up, there'll be a quick whistle. They're not going to allow for those battles along, along the floor. So, that's some of the stuff that the MIAA has come up with. Um, and in the next few slides, I'm gonna get into how we at SRS are going to uh, implement some of those changes. Uh, so first of all, for any basketball uh, event, practice or game, play, <clears throat> we're gonna have players arriving no more than 15 minutes early. If they get there prior to that, we're gonna ask that they wait in their vehicle and uh, at that 15 minute mark, we'll open the door. Varsity team for practice is gonna to report to the main gym. The JV team will, will go to the auxiliary gym. Uh, there may be times where varsity and JV will practice together. Um, and when that's the case, the, the varsity coach will you know, manage the socially distancing and, and uh, the cohorts that they're practicing with. But for the most part, the default will be varsity practicing in the main gym, JV in the aux gym. Uh, for all participation, I have created a pre-screening survey that our, our students or any participants will complete upon arrival. Um, 
It basically asks the, the, the relevant questions. Have you traveled outside the state or country in the last 14 days? Have you been exposed or anybody in your family been in contact with anybody deemed a close contact with anybody who's, who's tested positive in the last 14 days? And have you been had any symptoms in the last 48 hours? Um, and they'll do that by uh, scanning a QC code on, a, on a, a poster or a sign as they enter the building, they hold up their phone with the camera app open and it'll take them right to a link for it and they fill it out and that will give us the data that we need for contact tracing should something come up. Uh, for games, I'm, I'm gonna ask that the opposing team's coach complete the survey, uh, attesting that their team is in compliance and that he's asked everybody on his team those relevant questions. And that will be set up ahead of time with the athletic director of the visiting school uh, I'm going to ask the athletic director to get with the coach and give them the, the, the survey so that they can ask their players ahead of time. I, I think that the, con the congestion and, and asking the opposing team as they get off the bus to stop at the door and scan the code and enter in all the information, which is uh, it's not conducive to social distancing. And I think just having the coach uh, do that attestation for his whole team is, is a better way to manage that. But for our, our players as they arrive, uh, they should be arriving kind of sporadically and be able to social distance more. Um, we're going to have all of our players do it. Um, for basketball, I, I really wanted to shrink the footprint of where uh, our where players and, and coaches would be. We, we don't want people uh, roaming through the whole school since the school has uh, been pretty well locked down for visitors of all types. We want to really shrink down the footprint. So for practices, our boys team is gonna enter the building and the gym via the door outside of the boys locker room in the hallway between the auditorium and the main gym. Uh, and the girls team will enter on the other side of the gym uh, in the, in the uh, hallway between the main gym and the auxiliary gym by the trainer's room. Um, when we're hosting games, both our boys and girls will enter through the girls locker room hallway and our opponents will always enter through the boys' locker room hallway. And again, this is just being done to shrink the footprint and also to make to ensure that we don't have teams coming and going through the same door and there's no crossover. So just um, improving the traffic flow to, for social distancing. And it also keeps people out of um, the main areas of the school. Locker rooms are not available for changing, but we, we will leave them open and available as restrooms only. And again, that's being done to keep people out of the main uh, restrooms, main, the main hallway. Uh, there'll be signs posted. Coaches will know, um, myself, the, the trainer, custodians, and any visiting team coaches will be made aware that nobody's allowed out into the main hallway and the gym will be, will be able to keep an eye on that. Next. Uh, basketball practice schedule. Um, the boys and girls are going to rotate for the early practice slot as we do currently. And that might be every other day or might be every other week, but we want to make, ensure equity there with the early and late practice slots. Uh, the first practice will be from 2.30 to 4.15. From 4.15 to 4.30, the team um, will use that time to clean up, disinfect any other equipment as needed, anything that uh, needs to be touched up and cleaned up. Uh, the team will take care of and everybody out the door by 4.30. And that leaves from 4.30 to 5 for the custodians to come in and do any cleanup and disinfecting that they might need to do. And then same thing from 5 to 6 for the late practice, or 6.45 for the late practice, um, 6.45 to 7 for team cleanup and out the door, and 7 o'clock end of shift for custodians. And again, this schedule ensures only one team in the building. Um, custodians have, will have time to properly clean and disinfect according to protocols. So we won't have one team coming while the other team's leaving etc. We plenty of room built in there. Um, I've already mentioned the practice gyms. Players will be asked to bring their own ball for individual skill drills. That's um, one of the things in the MIAA guidance. Um, if they don't have their own ball, we will assign one to them. We will num number all of our balls and if we have to assign balls to every, every participant, we'll be able to do that. Um, coaches are to ensure social distancing and masks. Etc. As players walk in, there'll, there'll be designated spots for players to uh, put down their stuff, uh, all of their gym bag and, and, and any other 
stuff that they have, and that will become their spot for the duration of the practice when they're not actively practicing and running a drill, and they will return to that spot socially distanced from everybody else. And we'll have mass break areas as well. So this, uh, you can skip right over this one. I've asked all the coaches to do a written plan for me for what they envision themselves doing this year um, and, and how they plan on doing it. That was included in the packet that was sent home over the weekend. Uh, that was the basketball specific one from the boys and girls basketball coaches combined. I worked, worked on that one together. As far as general information from basketball, I, I tried to find information on uh, data on the uh, you know, numbers and tournaments and things that were going on. I, I couldn't really find any specifics relevant to basketball that were being played throughout the summer and the fall. There's obviously a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, there was a tournament for our league rather in Enfield that players from around the Pioneer Valley uh, played in from various different schools, including Southwick. Um, coaches from around the area coached in, in that tournament or in, in that league. And there were no uh, reported cases or transmissions that we know of from that league specifically. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any, any specifics for basketball. All right, uh, to shift gears to ice hockey, again, this is the MIAA guidance. I'm not gonna get into a lot of this. It's, it has a lot to do mostly with social distancing and how to uh, properly distance during the game, uh, limiting bench personnel, um, expanding team benches, things like that. Uh, just note that in basketball, this is the case as well. Everybody on the ice and on the court for basketball will be wearing a mask. That is a requirement. Hockey's already doing it. I think basketball is already doing it as well. And that includes game officials. The officials on the ice for hockey are gonna be wearing masks up on the ice and using electronic whistles. Okay. Next. Um, for hockey, how our practice plan uh, we're, we're very fortunate with our, our practice time at Amelia Park. We're going to be the first ones in the building, um, arriving at 5.45, 6 o'clock every morning. So the Amelia Park staff is, will do a deep cleaning at the end of the day, the night before. So we'll be walking into a, a, a clean building every morning. We'll be the first ones the first ones in there. So the, the risk of uh, you know, infection or, or it being passed along through um, contact uh, for our morning practice is very, it should be minimal. Our players will, again will arrive no more than 15 minutes prior. We'll check in with the coach, complete the pre screening survey, wearing their masks, uh, having designated mask areas, practicing in cohorts. Again, the in no congregating, the arrive, play, leave mentality uh, once, once it's over, get out of there. And our coach will build in sanitizer breaks and have sanitizer readily available on the bench for the players. For games, uh, we're going to follow all the established protocols set forth by Amelia Park Arena in terms of how to utilize the arena, um, traffic flow, and um, everything else that goes along with it. We're, we're very fortunate with to, to be at Amelia Park. It, it's one of the better rinks. It's probably the best rink in, in Western Mass as far as sanitation and attention to detail and just the quality of the facility itself. So we're lucky to, to, to be playing out of there. And they've been very cooperative with me. I've talked to them a couple of times about different situations and, and what they're doing to manage it. So we're fortunate to be working with and partnering with them in this. Uh, they've already established traffic flow patterns. They're, they're doing actively doing this currently with youth hockey and, and other programs that are playing there. Um, so we would just continue to do what they're already doing there. Uh, locker rooms are not available. Set up behind the benches, they will have uh, chairs available for players to put on their skates and helmets and gloves and stuff before taking the ice. Players are expected to arrive at the rink dressed in all of their equipment and ready to go, except for those the skates and helmets and gloves. Um, okay. Uh, on the bench, Actually, could you back up one, one more, Amy? Sorry. The last thing on that on that first slide. During games, we're going to have one line of players on the ice uh, and one line of players on the bench. So a line is just the five players, three forwards, and, and two defensemen. So we'll have basically one group playing in the game and one group of subs on the bench ready to go. Anybody else 
will be waiting in the designated team overflow area right, right next to the player's bench outside the playing surface. And at stoppages of play, the coach can take players from that overflow area, put them on the bench and take players from the bench and ice area and send them out to the overflow uh, section. And that will allow for social distancing and, and keep the bench from getting overcrowded. All right. So there'll be, there'll never, should never be more than 10 people on the bench, up to seven players and three coaches. Only one uh, penalized player is going to be allowed in the penalty box at a time. Again, this is based on the MIAA and the EEA guidance. And this is how we're going to implement it. Any additional penalized players beyond the one in the box will take a spot on the player's bench next to the penalty box and rotate in as penalties expire. And at the completion of the game, no handshakes. Visiting team will exit the ice there through their designated path, home team will leave through theirs. And we expect everybody to be out of the building within 15 minutes or so after the completion of the game. And they should leave the, the, the rink in the same uh, uh, clothing and equipment that they arrived in. So just, they just have to take off their skates, helmet and gloves and, and they can leave. All right, again, I asked all the coaches to do a written plan. This was the hockey coaches plan, which was in the packet that's sent home to you. You should have, have that accessible. Um, just some general information on, on the gameplay itself. Uh, USA Hockey is at the forefront of, of a lot of these uh, scientific studies of, of how the game, game is played and, and the impact on different things. They actually uh, sanctioned a study prior to uh, the COVID outbreak and published it just after uh, COVID last, last spring. But Dr. Stephen McGregor from the Eastern Michigan University conducted a survey of 12 to 18 year old hockey players. Uh, they attached sensors to them during practices and games. They did have data from over 15,000 sessions and the purpose was to quantify impacts incurred by players in practice. Yeah. They determined that um, player impacts in practices and games, whenever players come in contact with each other, they're, they're in that contact for less than one tenth of a second each time. And over the course of a session, a practice, or a game, they're in the immediate proximity or contact with other players for an average of about one and a quarter seconds per game. So obviously, some more, some less. So even though hockey is a contact sport, the, you know, the amount of time that players are directly in contact with others on the ice is minimal. Um, we know that hockey was locked down for a couple of weeks, and I would be remiss if I didn't address that. Um, even with the lockdown, Governor Baker was pretty clear that hockey, the game itself on the ice, was not the super spreader. You can go ahead and next slide, Amy. Uh, he said the behavior of coaches and parents around the game was the issue, and this is a direct quote from, from the governor at that time. Um, and the second paragraph underlined, so it wasn't so much the actual act of playing hockey, it was all the stuff that was around it. And the best way to describe it was these hockey tournaments was like a party. They start at seven o'clock in the morning, 25 teams there, uh, sort of an equivalent of tailgating going on in the parking lot. Kids play maybe two or three games. And when they're not playing, they're goofing around with each other in the way that kids do. And the parents are outside essentially tailgating in the parking lot. And that is what caused hockey's shutdown. So the guidance that was issued in order to restart hockey coming out of that shutdown illustrates that um, specific guidance that, that was issued that was different. Yeah. No more than one game per day, unless they were back to back. Uh, no teams from out of state were allowed to play in mass and vice versa. No play, no mass players allowed to play in out of state teams and no out of state players allowed to play on Massachusetts teams and locker rooms were to re remain closed. So that, that guidance that changed and that was issued coming as hockey came back kind of speaks to what the governor's concerns were. And the, the last bullet there um, also, I think indicates that the game itself was not the primary concern because prior to hockey shutting down, um, players were not allowed to check each other on the ice. Body checking was, was uh, banned from the game. But when, when hockey came, was allowed to restart on November 7th. That ban on body mm. checking was rescinded and players were allowed to check each other. And there was more, more potential contact between players on the ice. So I think that drives home the point that the concern wasn't uh, in game play on the ice. 
Uh, also looking looking for information similar to basketball in hockey I was able to, to get some relevant data uh, our, our local youth hockey league the greater Springfield Youth Hockey League in which Westfield Youth Hockey and, and several others around the area compete I, I spoke to Tim McMahon the president and asked him for some uh, data points the, that league has 97 teams uh, kids ages 6 to 18 over a thousand players. They at that point had played 160 games. They had, had well over a thousand practices and they had zero games canceled or postponed due to COVID concerns. And he was only aware of one positive test from a player and it was due to exposure from a family member. Um, it did cause that team to, to shut down and quarantine for a brief period of time while they investigated and, and the rest of the team got tested. Uh, there were no other cases found on that team. And he's, there are no known player to player transmissions within the GSL. All right, shifting gears to skiing, uh, the big one, big takeaway here again, this is the MIAA guidance. Um, let's see, the uh, clubhouse is going to be closed. So the skiers' method of transportation is going to become their warming area. And again, uh, arrive, play, leave, athletes will disperse upon conclusion of practice. There's, there's a bunch of others, but there's, we're just going to kind of move, move past this and get into the, um, the SRS plan. Sorry. <clears throat> so again, skiers are going to check in with their coach and complete the SRS screening. They'll be taken by bus to Berkshire East two to three times per week. Mask worn at all times. It'll be designated mask break areas. Players to load and unload their own equipment on the bus. No, no uh, handling of other people's equipment. Ski lodge will be closed except for the restroom facilities. Uh, the team bus will be the warming room. Uh, each team will provide it will be provided with a tent um, for inclement weather or you know, if it's windy or snowing or, or rainy. Uh, everybody will have, have access to a tent and it will be one for each team that's up there so the, there won't be any teams um, mingling up there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we will have a need for indoor dry land training with the ski team. So they'll be have to use the, the main hallway and weight room for that. Uh, when that happens, obviously we'll be communicating with the custodial staff to make sure that those areas get some extra attention, uh, cleaning and disinfecting on those days. And the coaches will have all necessary uh, PPE, sanitizer, et cetera. So I think ski, skiing is pretty straightforward. And this is what's a ski coach's plan um, that I asked them to submit. Skiing is pretty straightforward being outside, um, similar to golf in the fall, limited modifications there. So the SRS plan that involves stuff that's non-sport specific. You know, we will have an isolation room. We're gonna use the one that the school is currently using. No need to reinvent the wheel there. Um, the, if, if, if the athletes are outside, then a coach or event coordinator will designate um, where the um, isolation area would be. Uh, reason for isolation, isolate people if they have a temperature of 100 or higher. Um, if they have a positive COVID screen, hopefully they're not even showing up. Um, but if for some reason somebody does, we would isolate them right away. Uh, if somebody's exhibiting COVID symptoms, uh, we would also isolate. Um, just an inventory also of the equipment that we have available, pretty much anything that's needed, PPE, um, sanitation. The athletic trainer will also have a touchless thermometer available to take temperatures as needed. Uh, for screening, um, again, we, we talked about the online survey, a lot of the stuff we've already hit on. Um, let's see, game staff will complete this, yeah, the screening on arrival. Any symptoms, we're asking people to stay home similar to what they're doing in school already. Uh, any symptoms during practice will be sent to the trainer. If the trainer's not available, they'll be sent to me. If I'm not available, there'll be a coach that's designated to handle that, um, properly trained to handle it, those situations as, as a last resort. Um, I think that's, we can skip this, the rest of this, I think. So transportation, um, just, we're really not planning on making any changes to what we're what, we, what we've been doing all along. Athletes and families are responsible for getting themselves to and from practice and home games. Uh, basketball players that are at school on a delayed practice go home and return. 
Um, hockey players get themselves to and from Amelia Park for practices and games. Skiers get themselves to and from school to catch the bus to the, the mountain. Uh, when riding the bus, all of the existing uh, district and transportation company guidelines are going to be expected to be followed. Uh, we, we know that there's no more than 23 passengers on any of their buses, so we we'll make sure that you know, we're coming in under that number before we send a team anywhere. Kids will sit where they're supposed to on the bus, the windows will be open, etc. So again, we're not reinventing the wheel with, with any of that stuff. Next. Um, all right, I know this is probably a question that some of you had. What, what do we do if a student is not in compliance, if they're not socially distancing, if they're not wearing a mask? I mean, essentially I consider the athletic field to be an extension of the classroom. So all school rules and, and protocols and discipline will still apply. Uh, but within athletics, we also have uh, some ability to really get the kids um, to comply because they ultimately they want to be there. And if we don't allow them to be there, that we're, you know, we're taking that away from them. I think um, that that generally um, gets them to comply. And for the most part, this hasn't been an issue any in, in the school anywhere, the kids are wearing their masks, they're doing what they're supposed to do, what they're expected to do. But if there is an issue, uh, non-compliance, one, one reminder from the coach per session, per practice, per game, if the coach has to remind the same player uh, a second time, they will be asked to leave that practice, that game, that event, whatever. Um, if they're not able to get a ride, then they'll just be removed from the, the practice and wait off in a designated area until the transportation arrives. If it happens a second time, if a player is given, given the reminder or the warning and then asked to leave a second event in any in the, during the season, uh, they will not be allowed to rejoin their team until they have a conversation with myself or somebody in school, the school administration. And if it happens a third time, then we know that there's something bigger going on there. And, and at that point, they will just, uh, just disinvite them from the team. They will no longer be able to, to be a part of that team. So for positive tests and close contacts, again, we're not reinventing any wheels here. I mean, it's, it's what's being already being done within the district. If, if there is, we, we determined that there was a COVID test involving any athletes um, or any close contacts. Uh, the first step was is we're going to shut the team down. No more practices, no more games until we can have an investigation to determine who within the team would be considered a close contact of that individual and kind of proceed from there according to the district guidance that's already in place, uh, similar to what, uh, what would happen if this, a similar situation in a classroom setting. Um, <clears throat> for contact tracing directly related to athletics, that would be um, initiated by myself and or the athletic trainer. And we would work with school nurse and the town health officials um, on, on any contact tracing that needed to be done based on um, athletic participation. Our spectator policy. Um, we've, we've decided to, that we will not allow spectators at Southwick Regional School this year for basketball and for ice hockey during the 2020, uh, 2021 season. Basketball fans will be able to view home games and maybe even some practices uh, and some road games, depending on where which schools are, we, we might be going to, if they have the capability. Um, fans will be able to watch the game on live stream, NFH, NFHS network with, after paying a subscription. Hockey fans, most, most of them are already doing it. Uh, there's a service called Live Barn, which gives a camera feed from the rinks, again, for a subscription. So uh, parents will be able to to watch uh, their games. They just won't be able to do so in person. Uh, for skiing, if somebody wants to jump in their car and, and drive up to the mountain and, and freeze up, up at the mountain, uh, we're not going to um, keep them from doing that. They will, they'll be, be asked to follow the, the guidance set forth by the mountain and by the race coordinators and whatever guidance is set forth by them. Uh, the stakeholders, I surveyed parents, student athletes, and faculty, and also met with the, the public health nurse just to, to get different perspectives on how uh, people felt about having a season. For the parents survey, uh, one of the questions asked was, how concerned are you about your child contracting COVID from their teammates through participation? 
And as you can see, those numbers are kind of all over. Uh, some, some were concerned, some were not pretty evenly distributed. Um, how concerned are you from about your child contracting COVID from opponents? Again, that one was fairly evenly distributed, I guess lean, leaning more, more so toward the concern side, um, trusting in the, their own um, their own children and their, their teammates and friends, not so much trusting in, in what opponents might be doing, but still fairly, um, fairly evenly dispersed. <laughs> The next one, uh, how confident are you that the guidelines set forth by all of the alphabet soup of all the agencies can keep your child safe? Parents, as you see here, 67% um, of parents are confident that the guidance and, and protocols set forth are sufficient to keep their child safe while participating in athletics. Um, the other question, how confident are you that the athletic department, coaching staff, trainer, et cetera, officials and custodians can meet or exceed all of those, all of those guidelines in 75%, I'm very confident. So the parents believe that the guidance is strong and that we can meet or exceed that guidance. Uh, how will your students, student athlete get to practice? This goes back to the transportation piece, 134 parent responses, 101 said the primary means of getting the uh, student athlete to practice and events um, would be a parent or an adult family member. And on the other side, if necessary, would you be willing to get, test, get your child tested? Uh, again, an overwhelming response, yes, they would if, if needed. Uh, so we, did, we also did survey the faculty. Uh, there are definitely stakeholders in this as well. Uh, how concerned are you that a student athlete will contact COVID through athletics and spread it to others in the school? And the teachers were, were fairly concerned that that is a possibility. How concerned are you that um, COVID exposure will impact in-person learning? Again, fairly concerned, 34 out of 47. So that's a, a, definitely a noteworthy as far as uh, the faculty's feelings on possible spread. Uh, again, faculty, how, how confident are you that the guidelines and protocols set forth um, can keep people safe? Uh, this one's a little bit all over the place, leaning more so toward the confident side. Um, how confident are you that the athletic department, coaching staff, trainers, custodians can meet or exceed? Uh, this one, the faculty is showing confidence that we can meet or exceed all of that guidance. <laughs> And I asked the parents and the faculty, which statement best reflects your philosophy regarding SRS athletic participation in the winter? And you can see the parents overwhelmingly choose, you know, allow them to play, let them play. And the faculty is a little bit more evenly distributed, um, leaning more toward it's probably not a good idea. When asked, when asking student athletes, how confident are you about to get the guidance? They're very confident. And how confident are you that we can meet or exceed <coughs> that guidance? Again, very confident. Um, and speaking to the public health nurse and, and meeting with her last week, uh, the, the official position of the Southwick Department of Public Health is to support whatever decision that the school committee makes with regard to winter participation with reservations. Uh, she is concerned, especially now with, with the spike in, in, in cases um, that it could lead to some issues down the road, but she, the official position is that they're going to support whatever decision is made. So in summary, I, I think, I, I hope that this presentation has shown you that the data available to us indicates that the guidance and protocols established by the various agencies when followed properly have proven to be sufficient to stop the spread of COVID-19 on the field during competition. Uh, the issues have arisen when the failure to follow guidance has been an issue. Um, and I think the, I hope that you found the, uh, the athletic plan to be comprehensive to meet or exceed all of the established guidance and protocols set forth by 
MIA, EEA, et cetera. Uh, all stakeholders surveyed definitely um, had ex expressed overwhelming confidence that we will be able to do so. So with that, um, I was asked to present a couple of options of what a season might look like. So I think the, the first option um, would be a full participation for those teams that were, we were discussed, basketball, skiing, and ice hockey. The first practice would start January 4th. First competition would be January 14th or later. And the last competition would be February 21st. So we would be talking about a seven week season for those, those three sports. Um, and the season would be conducted according to the plan that I just laid out. Continued participation throughout the season will be based on the status of the district. Again, if we go in the red and, and go back to fully remote, then athletics would be shut down. And if opposing schools are in a similar situation where they're, they have in-person learning and they're forced to shut down due to being in the red, uh, we would just postpone any competitions against opposing schools in that same situation. So that would be option one. And option two uh, would be a conditioning slash intramural in-house sort of program that would allow for the students to, to work out, um, spend time with their teammates and friends, um, but not compete interscholastically. Um, the model that I see here is a couple of conditioning workouts per week in the gym. And those workouts would utilize the basketball practice model uh, that was laid out you know, using the same entrances and exits and uh, all the same protocols laid out for the basketball practice. Uh, you do double sessions depending on participation. And then on the other two days a week, we'd run four days a week. The other two days would be um, intramural type specific practices with their teams. Um, the downfall of, of a program such as this, uh, the ski team would still need to be bused to Berkshire East a couple of times a week. So there's a, an expense there and, and some logistical things to work out there. And um, as well as ski passes, um, lift tickets, you know, I'm not, I don't know. We'd have to re revisit that to see who's, who's paying for lift tickets and how that, that would all work out. And uh, for the ice hockey team, if they were to practice a couple of days a week, we would, we would be renting ice for them to do so. So there's, there's some budgetary concerns with that as well. Based on survey results and previous experience uh, with the fall, um, I, I don't know what to expect for participation in something like this. 57% uh, of parents said they would support it. 21 said they might support it. Um, but only 23% of the student athletes that responded to the survey said that they would, they would participate while 42% said they might. So uh, again, I guess it would depend on what other options were, were available to the student athletes on any given day as to whether they would be uh, interested in participating in that or not. And we really wouldn't know uh, participation numbers for sure until we began a program like that and, and kind of were able to gauge a week or two worth of participation to see if we if it was viable or not. Uh, and with that, uh, hopefully I answered most of your questions along the way, but if there are any other questions, I'd be more than happy to field them. Okay, first of all, A.D. Santagrin, I wanna thank you for your uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, and I'm gonna open up the floor to the committee. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the AD at this time? This is Pam, I have a few. Okay. Um, my first one was just going all the way back to the beginning of your presentation when you were talking, when you were had surveyed the PVIAC ADs um, and five of them had mentioned that um, in their districts in-person student learning was affected. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like what were, what would be some possible scenarios in which in-person student learning was affected as a result of um, athletics? Yeah, I, I know specifically, I, I spoke to the Long Meadow AD, I, and I don't have details on all of those, those cases that were reported out on that survey, but uh, specifically Long Meadow had a couple of incidents and, and one of them was uh, related to an opponent had a case and the, the symptom, the, the player's first symptoms appeared the day after a soccer game. 
and the positive test came came around eight days later. So, as you know, with with the uh, uh, contact tracing, they go back forty eight hours from the first sign, the first symptoms, and the day before the this person was first symptomatic, uh, they had played in a soccer game. So the uh, Don Meadow public health officials asked the athletic director if he could rule out that the team that that person had played against were close contacts or not by by the definition. And he said, well, if they were on the field together, we don't know who was on for how long. We don't know uh, anything like that. So in that case, um, they shut down the entire team and, and had them quarantine as close contacts of uh, the person who had or potential close contacts of the person who had tested positive from the other team from a game that was played eight days prior to the positive test. So that's, that's the type of thing that I think that we're seeing is it's, it's not, um, it, it's not necessarily um, cases being transmitted from, from player to player. It's contact tracing built in and around trying to figure out, um, you know, who was close contacts and, and just out of an abundance of caution, shutting things down. Okay. Uh, Pam, if I can, this is Joe, if I can just expand on that uh, to, to get quickly to the heart of your question. The impact that it would have on education is if we are in our hybrid model when we return from Christmas break, um, when the season started, and as Dave mentioned, if there was a student that became uh, symptomatic or tested positive, or there was a contest where a student was um, tested positive, we would simply go into either that cohort or or all cohorts would go into remote learning. Okay, that's that, that's thinking. yeah, that's the impact that we're talking about educationally is is uh, hybrid to remote. Okay. And and basically being co groups of students. Yeah, so it, it could be if it happened on a if the game happened on a on a, a Saturday morning and uh, the student was a cohort A student and maybe it's just cohort A and cohort B can come in. Um, maybe the student was never in school, he's a remote student. Um, so there would be some factors like that, but essentially the impact that a positive test for a student athlete would have on education is simply the learning model that would be in place for that team over uh, 10, 10 school days, um, and depending on when and if we caught it, if it would have to go uh, broader to the cohort. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question, well, first of all, I want to thank you for um, creating, disseminating, and reporting the results of the surveys um, to parents, students, as and teachers as well. Um, and um, it my question is, were those three groups of people provided with the um, sport specific modifications um, that would that are specific to their students sport um, prior to taking that survey? So, you know, when they were asking questions like, how confident are you um, that we can meet these protocols? Did they know what the actual protocols were? Uh, I the protocols were not provided by me, but they were available at the time that I sent the survey out. And it was pretty widely um, known and, and publicized that the MIAA guidance had come out. So any, any parent that had interest in it had it available to them. But I can't speak to you know, how many actually had re reviewed it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, you know, finally, I just have more comments than questions. Um, so when your slide where you were talking about um, students that were non-compliant, um, you know, and, and what the protocols would be, what the consequences would be, um, I was unclear about whether or not they would simply be removed from a practice um, or if they would also not be allowed to play in an upcoming game, you know, kind of similarly to like if you used to be if you missed a practice, you couldn't go to, to the next game. Um, you know, if you were asked to leave a practice, does that also mean that you wouldn't be able to play in the upcoming game? Uh, Dave, I'll, I'll answer that. Pam, we've, we've had, we've had uh, a very high success rate of students following the mask rules uh, when we've been in session. 
we've actually had very few students in grades seven through 12 that we've had to remind, um, if any, to keep their masks on or put their masks on. Uh, they've done, the students have done a tremendous job of, of following the rules and the expectations that we have around the safety measures. Um, if we got to that point where we needed to discuss with student athletes having their masks on in practice or asking them to leave practice, um, while there would be a, an opportunity for a reminder to keep your mask on, this is not a progressive discipline model. Um, we are very much view this as, as a privilege if they were given the opportunity to participate in sports that they need to follow the rules um, 100% of the time. And so if a student was asked to leave practice um, because they're not following the rules, um, I, I, I would anticipate that the conversation that the coach and Dave and, you know, an administrator would have, uh, administrator would have with that student would be, uh, you're no longer welcome on the team to participate. Um, you, you'll get a reminder and that would be, that would be the extent of it. We're not looking to suspend kids from practices or games. You follow the rules or you don't. Okay, thank you. And I also just want to say that, you know, all of the um, very extensive, you know, rules and, and, and district specific um, expectations that were outlined, um, you know, were very comprehensive and very well thought out. Um, and I do appreciate that. And, you know, my concern is really not with what happens when we are able to regulate and control what our students or our athletes do. My concern, like Governor Baker pointed out with um, hockey, was you know the behaviors that are much harder for us to control. And I see this in the classroom all the time as well. When the kids are in the classroom, um, they are absolutely following the rules. They're wearing their masks, they're six feet. Did we lose Pam? I think we lost her at their six feet. Yeah. That's my concern with regard to, to just the big picture. Um, and that's just simply a, a comment um, and a personal concern that I have. But I feel that you have been very, very comprehensive in, um, in doing your research and sharing it with us. And I thank you for that. Thank you. This is Chelsea. Um, like you said, Dave, it comes down to um, really following the, the protocols and having it be clear. Um, and I really appreciate even being able to click on that link to go or and use the QR code. I was able to go in and do the pre, um, pre-practice, pre-game um, survey and check it out, um, making sure that those things are set up, they're clear, um, they are consistent is how you make sure that people follow the rules when they're a little bit unclear or a little bit wishy-washy or a little bit different from person to person, that's when things fall apart. So I appreciate that you went through and made the survey and made those specific um, team by team guidelines with each of the coaches. Thanks. Any other questions from the school committee? I just want to say uh, thanks to Dave and, and um, Joe for work on this. Um, you know, we spent a little bit of time working through some of this stuff. And I know, especially for Dave, how much, uh, how much time and effort he's, he's put into this and wanting to get it right. And I think for, for everybody, for how things went the last time um, with, with short time frames and a little lack of information, um, I think we, we, we got a much better sense this time of, of a full plan. So I, I appreciate all the effort and time you put into this. Thanks, John. And thank you for your, for your help with working, working with me on it. I appreciate it. One big game changer um, that I'm thinking of also, this is Chelsea again, is that in the fall, we were, we were, kind of we were so low on the COVID map we you know we were the safe zone and everyone around us seemed to be unsafe at that point and now we're in the red um and the people around us are also in the red um so that's kind of different we felt like I felt like we really needed to protect our community and well at this point we are in the danger zone um 
but it is, it felt like it's a game changer to see that those who go into, um, the red, um, that they're not involved in sports and we wouldn't be involved in, in competing as well. So that, that danger of mixing with communities that are too dangerous is kind of removed. Amy Santigan, this is Jeff Hall. I have uh, one question for you. Um, you talked about uh, having thermometers available, uh, potentially for kids that had fevers while they were there to participate. Was there any consideration, uh, and specifically this is in my mind for basketball, um, for folks that are entering the building, uh, has there been any discussion or consideration to just do 100% te temperature checks for everybody as they're coming in to, to rule out any potential misses? Um, yeah, it, it has been discussed. We, it's something that, that could be done. Um, I guess I was looking, looking more toward the, you know, what, what is being done currently around the, uh, the area with other sports and other teams and other districts. And I'm not aware of anybody that's, that's doing that um, across the board, but certainly it could be done with, with you know, our athletic trainer, maybe a, a properly trained coach or somebody to, to assist um, we'd have to get a couple more thermometers, but um, wasn't there wasn't there a discussion, Jeff, at the beginning of the year about we were going to the students coming in, we were going to try to do that, right? And that was deemed to be we couldn't do it, I guess. Like we were going to temperature check stuff. Hi, this is Superintendent Jen Willard. To answer your question, Jonathan, yes, they deemed it not to be a. a reliable source of data. Um, I, I don't see anything wrong with doing it, but they yeah. just said that um, with the amount of students coming into the school, it wouldn't be a reliable source of data. Yeah, and I, I would worry about that, honestly, with the sports as well. It just that's kind of why I brought that up. Those The head scanning things are just, if anybody's ever used one of them, <laughs> yeah. it's... Uh, yeah. directional at best sometimes. I walked into a hockey rink last weekend and got, got my head scanned and I was at 91 degrees and they were okay with that. So, Well, those don't work if they're sweating. So they won't be accurate for if they're playing and then they decide they get develop a, a symptom and they check them either. Correct. Yeah, there's a lot of false readings on those. I think that I saw in your in the packets that were sent via email something about impact testing, and I don't know if you mentioned it in this. I did. Yeah, that that was on the uh, SRS uh, specific um, guidance. That was something that was uh, created by our our athletic trainer who does all of our impact testing. So basically, the the impact testing would still would still be a thing. All of our athletes would would be impact tested, but the trainer would send them a link to do it at home instead of doing it here in, in the building. Okay, so that is, that's for concussions, right? And Yes. Okay, so it was, I didn't know if the impact testing people came out with something related specifically to COVID. All right, thank you. I, I just wanted to add too from the notes that I have from our other me that the, I, I know that the time frame was mentioned, I believe, but the season is roughly seven weeks long and we're talking about 10 to 12 games, I believe, right, Dave? Yes, uh, five, five or six for the boys team, five or six for the girls team uh, in the building. And then, of course, we got hockey and skiing outside of the building. But. Yeah. I will say this, too, if you want to think of hockey in a way, hockey, they're going to be wearing a face mask and a mask. So um, I, I, I don't know how they're going to, you know, how that's going to be comfortable. But that if you want to think, I thought of that as sort of they've got double protection in a sense. All right, any other questions for the AD at this time? All right, I wanna thank you again for your uh, presentation this evening. Um, this will be on our next agenda uh, to make a decision on. Um, and I'm sure uh, if we have any other questions, we will either reach out through email or reach out through uh, the superintendent. So thank you again uh, for your presentation tonight. Thank you.
Okay, moving on to policies. Tonight we have three policies that we are doing uh, second readings of. First one up is BEDH public comment. Does anybody have any questions or concerns or thoughts? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next one, which is IKF or graduation requirements. Anyone have any questions, concerns, comments on this policy? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the last one, which is GCG uh, for substitute teacher employment. Any questions, comments, or concerns on this second reading? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the next agenda item. Next, our reports. We'll start with the superintendent. Hi, thank you, Chairman Hull. Uh, I just wanted uh, to let the school community know uh, that we um, have been in contact with uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to gather some information on their by next lab testing, uh, which would be give our nurses the ability to potentially uh, do like a rapid uh, COVID-19 test in the school. It will help us be able to uh, contact trace quicker and better and uh, it will just help uh, decrease the amount um, of exposure that we would be exposing other people to. Uh, so I'm excited about that, just to get on the waiting list for that. And the other good news uh, that we received yesterday afternoon was we were in contact with the state on getting air purifiers uh, for the classrooms at Woodland and at Powder Mill School. And um, we were notified that uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will be using their own Coronavirus Relief Act money um, and we will be getting uh, 45 air purifiers uh, for our school uh, for free. So at no cost to the district of the towns. Um, I do wanna say that since we've been back from Thanksgiving, we have reported four new cases for COVID, all four of them up at the regional school. Uh, one of them is a remote student, the other are three uh, students at the regional school. Um, to date, we have not gotten any reports uh, at Woodland or at Powder Mill School. And just a reminder to the community that we do post this updated uh, graph on our website every Wednesday. Our nurses put this out for the community. So you can see how many people uh, have tested positive and how many people are reporting uh, negative tests to us and just how many close contacts. You'll notice our close contacts has gone down since we have the remote since we don't have a lot of close contacts at school because we are not in person. So that is what I have. Thank you. Okay, Director of Finance and Operations. Uh, no real report tonight, Mr. Chairman. I did just want to mention to the other uh, members of the committee who, who may not have been in attendance at our budget roundtable, we did hold a budget roundtable in late November. Um, we had representatives from all three towns, uh, although the Tallinn representative was our school committee um, person who also serves on the finance committee there. Um, but it was a well attended meeting. Uh, we get some good information out to the towns that kicks off our uh, budget preparation season for FY22. Um, admittedly, we still don't have a state budget for FY21. So I think it's gonna be a, a bit of a slow process or at least to get rolling it, it will uh, it will take some time but uh, nevertheless uh, that was sort of our um, official kickoff to the FY22 uh, budget development season and that's all I have Steve I have one, one question sure uh, where are we with the uh, IT order have we got any dates on when we're expecting um, 
more devices for students? The only date that we had was really just a, a placeholder, uh, we believe, um, which was the end of December. Um, so that's the original order of, uh, it was actually two orders, one of 400 and another of 435 Lenovo um, touchscreen laptops. Um, continues to be a, a, a delay in those orders being fulfilled, not just for our district, but, but for uh, others across the country. Um, as you may know, we've probably mentioned that, um, mentioned it at previous meetings, we did fill in with some other units we were able to get our, our hands on. So we have 150 units we were able to acquire and those have been fully deployed uh, in, in various capacities throughout the district. Uh, there's another 75 that we ordered and are in receipt at, the, um, uh, at, our, at our dealer but have, we have not taken possession of those yet. That should be coming in the next uh, couple of days. And then those would be available for deployment um, and to serve as a, uh, a backup in, in the event that we did, uh, we, we wind up in a prolonged um, remote situation where maybe the resources that families have might not be adequate and um, these units would be available for, for deployment. So we're, We've kind of met the need um, up to this point, but we are still waiting for these other uh, devices, which would get us back on track with our planned uh, rollout. We, we really did, and the IT folks uh, and Mr. Taglieri uh, deserve a ton of credit for basically getting units that you never would have uh, thought could be deployed um, deployed to our families. So hopefully they're, they're working out for people. Um, but we've got you know older laptops out there, desktops, uh, devices that needed to be upgraded in uh, with with hardware upgraded, with operating system, with software. Um, they work tirelessly at getting these things out there. So we've sort of met the need up to this point, but we know that it it, it could change as as we go forward. Thank you, Steve, your update on that. Okay, moving on to subcommittees and liaisons. Anybody have anything they would like to report out on this evening? Okay, moving on to our second public comment. I'll ask Amy to check the superintendent's email address. Chairman Hool, I have one public comment from Gary Whittier, Southwick, Mass. <clears throat> Mr. Whittier writes, <clears throat> I had written Chairman Hool and Superintendent Willard back in October, <clears throat> excuse me, with some facts regarding hockey and the current pandemic. I have also spoken with David Sandergren and provided him with a additional facts and outline the steps I will take to limit the risks of spreading COVID since my letter to you. I would like to share some additional information with you to help you make the right decision in allowing these student athletes to participate in sports this winter. My two sons have been playing hockey since August. There had been no cases in Western Mass in any ranks until two weeks ago. My youngest son's team played against a player from another team who tested positive two days after the game. That team was forced to quarantine for two weeks, and that ends this coming Friday, and no additional players tested positive. Not one player on my son's team came down with COVID further demonstrating that with the safety protocols that have been put into place and the fact that players are not within a six foot radius of another player for more than three minutes, let alone 15 during a hockey game is during a game hockey is as safe a sport to play. The town's board of health determined our team was not within a six foot radius for 15 minutes and therefore, per CDC guidelines, we did not need to quarantine. Hockey is about creating time and space. 
As Dave mentioned in his presentation, the one school that had a hockey related incident was due to kids and families congregating at hotels and in parking lots as they waited to play their next game in a tournament. We will not be playing in tournaments or congregating at any time. The MIAA has posted the guidelines in order for these kids to play. Let's allow the kids to represent Southwick on the ice. Thank you. And that concludes public comment for this evening. Thank you, Amy. Okay, moving on to committee discussion. Any old businesses this evening? Any new business this evening? So I just had a question for Amy. Um, the uh, PowerPoint slide that um, the AD slides that the AD presented. Um, did we receive those separately? No. No. Um, did I hear correctly that they were going to be posted on the website, or if not, can you send those to us? Yeah, I will post the PowerPoint to the website along with, there'll be a recording of the meeting, but I'll also um, make the PowerPoint available too, so people have time to go through. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. At this point, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We'll do a roll call vote. Pam? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ted is no longer with us. John? Yes. Maria? Maria? Ryan? Yes. And Jeff is a yes. Motion passes 5 0 0. Thank you, folks. Have a great evening.